I think we all struggle with motivation. I don't know about you. Depends on what it is, right? You know, I mean, a lot of times there's things that we get really excited about. And, and when I started looking at this word, um, it made me think of my backyard. Yeah, it kind of, I, I just gone for a week, over a week ago, went down to Louisiana and had to find the motivation to load a 26-foot truck and then drive 16 hours across the country and motivation to unload it. Well, motivation to unload it was so I could get it done and then get home. Then I come home and I look through the back window and then I realize how warm it's getting and then Dale didn't help. He talked about how he had some tomato plants that, you know, he was going to give me some starters and I looked at my garden and I'm like, oh man, look at that thing. He's going to give me those plants and I, I don't have it ready. And so I, I thought, well, like, I got to get motivated. I mean, and that, but then to get to the garden, I looked at all the stuff and oh, the disaster of the backyard and so I had to get the lawn, the rototiller going and spend hours there and it, it wasn't fun, you know, it just wasn't fun. But it was hard. But when I got done and I looked back and I see my backyard and I see that corner of the garden all ready and then Dell walked up all ago and he said, hey, got your tomato plants ready. I was like, hey, it kind of paid off, didn't it? Because, you know, I'm not sitting there getting those tomato plants and then going, oh my, what am I going to do with them? They're going to die before I can get them in the ground? Because I'm terrible. I'm always slow about getting my garden going. It's like I'm about four weeks late, and then I get fired up to go, and then they start to come about, you know, producing fruit about the time it starts to freeze because I'm, I have no motivation, just kind of slow about it. I find that in a lot of different aspects of my life where it's challenging um, to try to find that motivation, and that's a weird word. Think about it. You know, when I looked at the definition of what motivation is, it, it was very complex in psychological ways and how... You know, it's some sort of a force or some sort of an emotion or feeling or, or uh, something that causes you to do something, to, to go into action. And we see that all the time. And I'm fascinated by sometimes I see people that, like, climb Mount Everest. What was your motivation? You know, to, to go out and put yourself through such extremes in order to accomplish that. I look at people in their, their protests or different things that they do in their lives, and I just wonder... What gave you that motivation to want to accomplish that, to go out and make that effort? Because that's usually what's required, isn't it? I mean, you can't sit there and say, I got motivation to go clean my yard, and then just sit there. Well, that wasn't really motivation then, was it? Well, maybe a mental one, but almost like faith without actions. So when it comes to serving God, we waver, I think, with a lot of things that we have, and we, we struggle with it. And I always use this because I see people when I'm talking to them that they have this idea of, of kind of that half full, half empty glass. Now, it's nothing negative to say about people, you know, but honestly, if you just took a glass and put it half full and they didn't know what this was and said, how would you describe that? A lot of people would say, well, it, and this has been a study. They'll look at that glass and they'll see it as either they'll say it's half full or they'll say it's half empty. And that's, that's you, one or the other. And it, it interesting, psychologists have said, because that's kind of the reflection that people have. For example, me looking at my backyard, I looked at it as half empty. I, I saw nothing but the empty side of, you know, the reward of it. Instead of saying, well, you know what? You have the fence up. It's already been established for the garden area. You already have this in place. You have this in place. But no, I, I looked at that as half empty. So there is different ways that we view things. But overall, are you a half full or a half empty person? Because a lot of times people do that. Now, it doesn't mean that either way can be good. I, my half full glass seems to be full glass when it's really half empty. And I get over ambitious. I get over optimistic. And then I'm, I'm wrong. So... That's why I said, you know, this is nothing to necessarily run one person down or the other. But we, we, we look at those motivations, we have to kind of figure out what's going on behind it. You know, we kind of, uh, you know, evaluate, is it the right thing? Um, am I doing it out of fear? Sometimes medical procedures, you know, you, you don't get that motivation until the doctor finally says, look, we either fix it or we cut it off. And then you go, okay, let's fix it. 
So we have these motivations, and they're healthy. That's the other aspect I think that is important to understand is that they're, they're very important. I have always believed that God kind of built that half-full, half-empty ideology in us. By default, I don't know that it was purposeful, but He speaks to us that way. I mean, He provides things that it depends on how you are. For example, when we consider that when Moses stood up on that mountain and he delivers the law, God gave them the motivation. He said, here's half full. You follow me, here's the half full side of this. You're always going to prosper. Your crops will never fail. Your families will do well. You'll never have an enemy at all. You won't have to have an army. And then he said, here's a half empty. You don't obey me, I'm going to kill you. Your family, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to bring a plague upon you. I'm, your crops are going to fail. And so, and I'm sure that people that were listening to that, in that audience, we kind of talked about that this morning, how you know, they stood there and heard, they heard basically the blessings and the curses, and they all said, Amen. We agree. We'll do this. And I always wondered, I'd love to have taken a survey and said, is it because of the half full or half empty? How many were doing it out of, whoa, I don't want to do this because I don't want my crops to fail. I, I'd rather have this. But, you know, then seeing it from that point, do you want to go to heaven or do you want to avoid hell? What's your motivation? Because that sometimes is even the start of the process with the relationship with God, isn't it? Depends on where you're at in your life. Sometimes it motivates you to get back to church. Maybe because you see things that start to cause you to see the half-empty side of it, and you go, oh, I don't want a part of that anymore. So it's healthy. There's a part of it that's healthy. But even within those, I think that we have to be careful because there are motivating factors behind them. And we see that as well in many stories that I thought about bringing up and talking about and showing why people were motivated to act in the Bible. So we can see that you can be motivated to do something for the wrong motives, and you can see people that are motivated for the right motives. And we have to be able to distinguish sometimes. I think the people who are always looking at the half empty, with, especially when it comes to God and seeing the negative side, that's not really the right motive. God doesn't want that. I think He really wants you that if, if that's not going to stop you from seeing the beautifulness that He gives you, then He's going to give you the negative side and say, now look, here's the opposite. Now choose. Which one do you want? Do you want the half full, the blessings? Or do you want the empty? Do you want these punishments? Because there's no middle ground. And it's, you know, He's saying that that's all it is. That's the best I can do for you. So our motivations are important. So we're going to just basically, in this lesson this evening is going to look at wrong motives and right motives. Now, I want to also bring up the idea that this was Sunday morning's lesson. I told you that this morning, didn't I? When I preached. So this was in the morning lesson, and I'm flipping the Hebrews to the morning. And so I need some help from you guys to whether I continue to go ahead and do topical type of lessons, let me pick them, or you know, maybe look at another book to go through and study. Because I've really started to see some books that I want to go in and bring lessons out of those. Um, so if you have any suggestions, otherwise, well, I'll, I'll come up with something anyway between now and next Sunday. But I'm thinking about other books to look at, uh, Romans, Galatians, or a prophecy, maybe, I mean, one of the prophets or something, but I would love to have some input, suggestion or something. If somebody suggests something, I'll start working on it. If you don't, well, then I'll start working on something. So either way. But I wanted to inject that in there real quick. Um, because usually I do the topical stuff in the mornings, and then I've been doing studies in the, in the evenings, but that's okay. It's still a great lesson. I like this because I think that we need to look at our, our ability to motivate. Let's start with the wrong ones. Let me talk about wrong motives um, when we look at them. One of the biggest ones that growing up that I started to see and not really identify and know what it was and, and hear it because... When we hear stories of people that Jesus encountered and how he encountered people, we started to see this reason people were motivated to righteousness because of legalism. And you say, well, that's not too bad. I mean, don't you want to be legal? But you see, legalism can get too harsh. 
And that's what we saw with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Essenes and different sects that were uh, existing, different groups of people that were religious that were honestly, sincerely trying to serve God right. And why did they do that? Well, they had a history of idolatry and that led them into captivity in Babylon. And so they come out of that. Now, one of the great things about that, I always like to bring this up, is when they came back from uh, captivity, idolatry was gone. You never see idolatry come back up again in their history. That's pretty amazing. Because all the punishments from the period of the judges and all of that stuff, all the invasions that were going on, and then Israel getting destroyed, the ten northern tribes, and all the punishments happening, and then finally they go off into captivity. They've struggled with idolatry throughout all that time. But man, when they came back, never again. Idolatry was gone. And they were very concerned and very sincere about saying, you know what, we need to make sure that doesn't happen again. Let's don't repeat history. So some people said, look, you know what, let's get a group of people together, and let's, let's look at the law, and let's try to make sure that we follow. <laughs> we follow what God wants. And let's don't allow ourselves and our neighbors and stuff, to start to meander away from it. Because we know what it gets us. It gets us a trip to a foreign country. It gets our temple destroyed. And so that's where they come from. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. Very sincere. I beat them up all the time and they're a fantastic group for people to do so. Why? Because of legalism. And you know, a lot of times, you know, I was growing up, but I also think, thank the Lord, we don't have them anymore. And then I grew up a little more and got a little more mature, and I realized, uh uh-oh, we do have them. They didn't change their, they they changed their names. We don't have the title anymore. But you see, that's the thing about us humans, right? We don't seem to get rid of baggage or learn from the history. We just, we may not call it the same name, but it's the philosophy behind those things. You haven't changed. So it's one thing to be legalistic and want to have things legal. So the Jews had a struggle in that transition away from the Mosaic law and legalism. And you can see that confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees from the moment he, he started preaching. And they were always looking at point of order. They would always look at that. And he would trip them up because he would say, now wait a minute. Have you not read from the beginning? Wait, wait a minute. You who without sin, you throw that first stone. And so he started, wait a minute. That's what you would call gray area. I've heard somebody say one time, we're talking about a certain topic or a certain issue in the church. And I said, well, you know, that depends. He goes, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. There's no gray area. It's black and white. And I stopped and I thought and I go, yeah, it, the page is black and white. I mean, the verse says it. But then I started learning and growing and saying, wait a minute, you know, absolutely, but there's context. There's, there's a lot deeper thinking about it than just saying one verse, one chapter, that's what it says and that's it. And to extract that out and hold it out by itself was doing as much violence as anything else. And so it was verses like what Paul wrote in Ephesians that started to wake me up to this and looking at what Paul said like in Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9. And legalists struggle with this. This type of talk makes a legalism, a legalist a little nervous. And some people do. And if you've got a little legalism in you, you'll know what I mean when I start to talk about it. Because even me, sometimes when I look at this, and I hear people say these words, it makes me a little nervous because then I think, well, if you're not legalistic, you're not following God's Word, then what are you? And I still have that in my nature because that's the way I was kind of raised. But look what Paul says. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works lest anyone should boast. So let's put it into context because he is talking about people who are probably looking more at the law, which was works. It was very physical. You showed up at the feast. You provided the right tithe. You followed the prescribed written law. 
and that's what you did. And those were works. Those were physical acts, in other words. Let's, let's, let's clarify that idea of works. Because those are physical acts and things that a person were do, was doing and thinking that somehow that that's all I had to do. But where's the love of God? What, what was your motivation, see? If you're motivated by just following the letter of the law, but you don't love God, there's, there's the fault. There's the problem right there. And so when we read that, because we've had to, to fight against false teaching so much, that we're uncomfortable saying something like what Paul said, by grace you have been saved through faith. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Well, of course not, Ron. Paul said it. It's a scripture. No, no, no. Grace? Is that one of those warm and fuzzies? No. It's the blessing and the favor of God. Jesus Christ was the grace manifest of God. You didn't deserve it. You had no reason to receive any favor at all. And so it's a grace in which He bestowed upon us. And it's through faith, which is knowledge. It's not just, it's faith, it's knowledge. That together combined. And you had nothing to do with it. It didn't matter if you were the greatest high priest. You know, if you were the most faithful worshiper in the temple. None of that was going to save you. None of it. The blood of bulls and goats could not save them. All the people before were dead in their sins without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's what's difficult to wrap your mind around because we don't live in that type of dimensional existence. But God, because when He laid the foundations of this earth and He saw that we were going to sin, fall away, and He had to fix the problem, He established a plan. And that plan was the perfect sacrifice would be offered because there had to be a sacrifice. We broke His law. Righteousness declares you have to die. You have to die has to be something of equal. And from the moment that Eve did, the only thing that God could really do would be to kill her to remain just and righteous. But he had already seen it coming. He planned ahead to take care of us. And so he was able to look into the future and know with certainty because he was all-powerful that this sacrifice was as good as happened already. It was as good as happened already, but it hadn't. And so time marched along, sacrificial systems came up, and that paid the interest on the debt. That's it. And so when you bring that forward and you consider that all they were doing was paying the interest, well, what happens? If the bank says, that's it, I want the principal now. Wait a minute, I've been paying the interest. That's the sacrifice. That's the sacrificial system. It's gone. I want the principal now. Well, what is it? It's perfect sacrifice. Do you have it? Do you have it? Oh, you don't, do you? And God said, I do. I got it. I gave it to you. And so that's why I say that if Christ had not come, all those before He came would have died in their sins. But God knew He was going to come He knew that sacrifice was going to occur. So all that actions, all those activities that they were doing, their little pilgrimages to the temple, their praying, all that stuff wasn't going to save them. It was Jesus Christ's blood that saved. And that's hard again. But that's the only thing that saves you. There is absolutely nothing, when it really honestly comes down to it, that can make us ever, ever worthy of it. That doesn't mean stop, you know, stop doing anything, but it just like he says there, so you can't boast of yourself. No matter how much you're doing, always remember you could never have paid it under the old system, and you can't now. It comes through grace, through faith of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 3 20 and 22, look at what he says there. Therefore, by the deeds of the flesh, no law will be justified in his sight. For by the law is knowledge of sin. That's the only thing law does. Law defines, specifies, states it obvious. Here it is. 
But now the righteousness of God apart from the law. Now the Jews say and go, whoa, wait a minute. There is no righteousness apart from the law. The law is righteousness. There is no other righteousness. You get circumcised. You start uh, you know, following the, the law. You grow up a good Jew. You do your sacrifices. You honor the, the feast days and stuff like that. That's how righteousness would come. And so this is a mind blower to the Roman Jew listening to this. He goes, no, that's not, that's not how you're saved. He said, apart from that law has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So they were talking about it. That's what he's saying. They've been talking about this. You're trying to say the law is saving you and that you're righteous by the law, but he's saying the law and the prophets have been talking about this, guys. That that wasn't the way it was going to be. That's not where final salvation was. And it was witnessed, testified, told about. Were you listening? Were you reading it? He said, they told what? They said, it's through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe. There's no difference. Then we're back to belief again. Again, that's kind of, you know, where you talk about faith only. Yeah, faith only is the only way you can be saved. But faith is going to call into your behavior, change the way you act. So next to legalism is guilt. And I find this one is, is just as destructive. The people are motivated by their guilt. Their guilt is either holding them back, you know, or, or they're somehow feeling so unworthy that it does. And so, you know, we have the most beautiful solution. And, you know, the Lord understood our insecurities of the righteous, those who are truly wanting to, to serve God and knowing that, yes, I just blew your bubble all apart that there's no amount of righteous work that you're going to be able to hustle and do and get to heaven and go, here's my list of all the accomplishments that I did. But then he says, that's okay. And this is where then guilt piles. Then we go, oh, well, then if I can't, then there's, what, what can I do? And so then we dogpile ourselves with, the, with being motivated. Guilt causes that. And that's where John expresses and tells us, in 1 John, you hear me say this a lot, in 1 John 1.9, he says, if we confess our sins, this is how we resolve our guilt. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Guilt shouldn't be a problem for the Christian un unless you're not repenting of it. Guilt is healthy. Guilt is humbling. Guilt will motivate us, hopefully, in the right direction. But a lot of times we allow guilt to be that negative force on us. The third one is, when it comes to wrong, and you see this as well as people, and this is where the world loves to throw this in our face, is how people are self-seeking. We see a lot of people that, you know, they serve God because it really benefits them. And it, it, it came out, because I, I did the same thing. I, I, I was, you know, the same way as when I moved to Las Cruces and uh, looking for a church, you know, I was trying to figure out because, you know, I grew up here and all the different relationships with different churches. And I was like, you know, well, I really don't know where to go to church. And it was Joe Griffin. I called and I was talking to him. And he goes, you got it all wrong. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you're looking to what they can give you. He said, you need to be looking at what can you do for them. It's not about you. You see, I was self-seeking. I was looking for what the church was going to provide me. And how wonderful they were going to make me feel. Instead of going, you know what? This group of Christians, I can help and work and build up. This other one, maybe they don't need it. Maybe I have a talent for something that I could provide where this other church, they can't really use my talent. Maybe that group of Christians is better and that's fine. Do we ever do that? Do we ever look for a church? How many times do people look for churches when they're moving and locating somewhere and go, wait a minute, now I can do this and this, and that church, man, they can do that and that. They, 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 they got people. But this other congregation, they're really struggling. They, they need help in teachers or whatever it may be. I can do that. That's where I'm going to go. Mm, not really. I don't hear people doing that. I, I don't hear Christians call me or friends that I've had and say, man, I found this church that needed song leaders, and man, I can lead singing, so I'm going to go worship over there when I move there. So be careful. Now, I'm picking that a little hard, but 
that is a reflection sometimes of what we are motivated by. Why we go to church. Is it about you? No. Now, from my point of view, yes. Me should be about you. You should be about me. But we have to be careful because it does. In, in 2 Timothy 3, 2, the Apostle Paul says, For even men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. What a lump of that. Think about that. That's a horrible list to get caught up in, but this is all the reflection of people who are thinking of themselves, children who are selfish. Whew, boy, we see that happening a lot in our country today, in our families. One of the biggest things I think that's fracturing a lot of relationships is simply self-seeking, not selflessness. And so that's the wrong motivation. If you're going to church because of what they're giving you, you're seeking you know, what it's providing for you and not the other way around, that's a wrong motivation. Paul says also in Romans 15, 1 and 2, he said, for when we are strong, we ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. Again, it's not about seeking what I can get what you're going to provide me, but what I cannot, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? Do we look around that way? Because we need to. Just think how beautiful that would be. You, you'd have to tell people to leave you alone. I mean, if you had 50 people and they're all looking out for you, it'd be like having 50 mamas trying to, you know, take care of you all the time. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You'd have so many people taking care of you, it'd be a problem almost. We know that probably won't happen, but that's the gist of it. So we need to be looking out the other direction. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, uh, 33. He said, Just as I also pleased men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many. Why? Why did he do that? Look at the last part. That they may be saved. Do you think about the other person when you talk about what can I do for them? That it's linked to their salvation? That our motivation for helping others is about their salvation? Or is it to get some reward from them by saying, oh, thank you, thank you, or petting you on the back? Or, but let's put it down to what it really should be about. Like Paul said, all the things that I did for all men really drilled down to the idea that it is about their salvation. That's what he wants for you. Do you want that for others? Then be motivated the right way, not the wrong. So now let's shift over to the right motivation. Some things that I think are more natural and, and more positive when we think about it and ones we think about. And this may be obvious, but I think it's foundationally not really a part of our psyche, the fiber of who we are because of our society and our definitions, the way we use words. And, and, and it's that word love, motivation by love. Because again, you know, we, we just have that confused thought of what love is. Everything about it has to start with the right motive, and it has to start with love. The rest of your motivations beyond this, we, I could stop the lesson right now. Just stop. Because honestly... If you have this one, and you have this downright, <laughs> it, it's mute point. Everything, because everything is going to be so driven in a beautiful direction. Your motivations will always be right. But let's dive in. Matthew 22, 37-39, when he was asked that most important question, you know, about what is the greatest command, and when he comes back, just for brevity's sake, Jesus said to him, You shall love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Every part of who you are. You want God. You have this excited feeling, but you have this desire to please Him. And you're willing to sacrifice everything that you're about in order to please God. We understand that. 
And then the next one he said is right there. Right there. The way that you're loving God is the same way that you need to love everyone. That's harder. But it's on the same level. You can say, yeah, I love God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. That's the greatest command. I got that. I like that. That makes me feel pretty good. But then when you really have to admit that I, you have to love me as much as you love yourself the way you love God as well. And they're connected. It's just kind of like that, that forgiveness thing about sin. You want it, you got to give it. You want forgiveness, you got to give it. You want that type of love from God, you got to be it. You got to give it as well. So in John 14, 21, Jesus says again, pretty boldly, he says, he who has my commands and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So there's obedience. We talk about grace and works and all that, but look at this. Motivation with love is going to take care of those things. It's what's going to help carry us through. He says, he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That is a little hidden nugget there. Look at that last part. I will reveal myself to him. We talk about who is ever going to see the, hear the gospel, and we talk about sometimes those things that, you know, well, what if somebody ever hears the gospel, blah, 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 you know, and are they going to be condemned and all this? And you know what? We know Paul talks about that kind of an issue in the first part of Romans when he talks about the idea that there were Gentiles who did not have the law, the Mosaic law, but yet in their hearts they were doing what was right. And I think when we tie this back into this idea right here, when he says that they loved, in other words, they had a love for righteousness. Now maybe they didn't know it was God, but now when we bring this into somebody who is truly seeking God, genuinely, not seeking an institution to feel better about resolving their sins, but loving God, then you're going to follow what he says, and he will make sure that you see him. You're going to make sure he sees you. Over in John 12, 27 and 28, look what Jesus says in his relationship to pleasing his Father and that type of love. Jesus says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So even the Lord loved the Father enough to put that aside and sees that. In 1 John 4.11 Beloved, if God so loved us, we also should love one another. If God so forgave you, doesn't it link the same way? It's kind of connected. You want forgiveness? You have to forgive your pe- the people that have injured you. You have to be a built person who can forgive. If you want to be loved, then what does he say? We should love one another. You can't sit and say that you love, your, love God with all your heart and all your soul and then turn around and neglect the relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're connected. You proclaim that you love God, but then you neglect your brothers and sisters in Christ. The other great one is thankfulness, gratitude. It's a great motivator, reminding ourselves of what we have. We see a lot of ungrateful people, don't we, in societies? And they're despicable. <laughs> you know, when I see people that are not thankful for what's been given to them, and, and we see that in people who have been just given maybe certain money, wealth, cars, or things, and they just wander it. And you look at it and you say, man, look at what you've been blessed with. Look what you've been given you have absolutely no gratitude for it at all. You don't have an appreciation for what you have. And that's what we have. In Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul says there, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which it's your reasonable service. It's not hard to do that. In Galatians 2, 20, 
the Apostle Paul says, it is I who have been crucified. Now follow through with this. Now look at his logic, the way he goes, this is great. I have been crucified with Christ, but Christ, it is, Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave, me, gave himself for me. There's the gratitude. He understood why he was willing to kill himself, in other words, the spiritual old man, and become, you know, as much as he could, the manifestation spiritually of Christ, and he no longer was there. He's willing to kill that off so much. Why? Because he was thankful for what he had done for him. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. So I'm willing to kill that old man of sin off. 1 Timothy 1.12, Paul says there, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He was thankful because he allowed him to be a part of it. How many, sometimes we see people that are, are you know, they, they look at things they do in the church as almost just like a duty roster. Well, I got the opening prayer. Well, I got to serve on the Lord's table. You know, you're blessed. You know, we need to look at what we're doing for one another as a tremendous blessing because of what has been given to us and allowing us to do that. The other way that we show our right motivation and reflection of why we have that right motivation is because our living actually is a reflection of gratitude of what Christ has done for us. So, that's the way we show it. The other great motivation is the internal, eternal significance. Now, I know if you're a half-empty glass person, you just thought about the bad side of eternal, right? I got you, because sometimes you do that. But what about the beautiful side of the eternal existence that he talks about? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses um, 9-10, through 10, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor ad- adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, or thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So why would I want to be a part of that? Why do I want that? I want the kingdom of God. So I want to not be a part of that. Hebrews 6, 11 and 12. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. We've seen brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone on. We know. We see what they've lived. And that they've inherited that as well. And we've got some great rewards as well to help motivate us towards that. In Mark 10, 28, here we see that Jesus says, Surely I say to you that there is none who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands and, and with persecutions, and in this age to come, eternal life. And there's nothing greater and more powerful than looking at the extension of our family as Christians. I traveled across this country and go to different places. I, two weeks ago, I was in Louisiana, and I, had, I met some brothers and sisters that I never met before. But they're my brothers and my sisters, and they welcomed me. What a wonderful thing when you consider that that's just one little location. I mean, this, this little world that we're in, no matter where we go, we have this extension of family all around us. Revelation, John the Revelator says in twenty two twelve, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Ultimately, our motivation, I think, to sum up the most positive one should be us looking at the cross, looking at what was accomplished there. And when we compare all that was, I don't know, it's such a horrible event, and yet such a beautiful event, and that should have been us on the cross, should help to shape our motivation to serving God. So what is your motivation to serve God? I hope that you will evaluate it, look at it, and work on it. And I know you can waver. We all waver, and that's, that's kind of natural. But reach back 
and be motivated by the right purposes before God. If you're with us this evening, there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with God. I hope that you would let us know. We're going to be singing this invitation song. If you're with us, let us know. If you're online or something, drop us a letter or email or a comment through there. We'd love to get with you and, and help you out. If you've got any questions as well, let us know. So let's consider these things while we stand and sing the invitation song. Oh, the bitter pain and sorrow that a time could ever be when I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee, all of self and none of thee. When I proudly said to Jesus, all of self and none of thee, yet he found me, I beheld him, bleeding on the accursed tree, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee, some of self and some of thee, some of self and some of thee, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, brought me lower while I whispered, less of self.